about going back to making it an organic farm. It wasn't organic back then. He did use some, and I'll show you what he used. I'll show you that this idea, this guy, by the way, if Dewey had won the election instead of Truman that year, remember the newspaper that says, Dewey wins, and it was a mistake? Mm -hmm. Truman won in that election. If Dewey had won, this guy would have been Secretary of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. We just might have had a different segue into a grass-based farming system that might have pulled us out of the throes of where we're at now, sooner. But this thing turned into this experimental farm um, you can't see all those little heads back there, but they would get up to 10,000 people at a field days. Now, that was back in the day when a lot of us were farming. In World War II, one out of three to one out of four people were living on farms in the population. The United States was a very interesting country at that time. It was the only country that was the most industrialized and the most agricultural country in the world at the same time. Usually you have one or the other. The United States had both going on at the same time. Brilliant place to be witnessing at the time. Now we got rid of our agriculture. And we even got rid of our industry. <laughs> right? I don't know what we are. We consume. That's what we are. We're a country of consumers with a lot of debt to buy everything that we can't afford to buy. It's amazing. And so he had these people coming out there watching this thing going on. And so you can see me work. All the springs that were dried up all came back. They had 15 productive springs that weren't producing water. They got the springs running again. Because they brought back what? The humus. The organic matter. The sponge. So that when it rained, instead of it becoming storm water going into the creek, it went into the aquifer, went into the springs, recharged the springs. And then they ended up using these springs for irrigation in a drought year. So he said, how do you make soil? Nature makes it the old-fashioned way, geological time. You know, if we live four score and ten, that's not geological time. That's human time. Geological time is thousands of years. And nature doesn't have a clock. So it just takes its time and grinds it out by putting one glacier and then a, reset, a receding of the glacier. Crops grow in there, and the next thing you know, a thousand or two thousand years goes by and we have topsoil. Well, we don't have a thousand or two thousand years when you have no topsoil and you're not going to live more than a few decades when you're a middle-aged man. So what do you do? How do you make soil? Eight years later, they created four inches of topsoil using ladino, which is white clover, brome grass, and alfalfa. That was one of their formulas on that farm. And they got alfalfa roots to go down 14 feet deep in the ground. Now, one thing that Bromfield had going for him, he had the gift of the glacier, which completely uh, left him a subsoil that was loaded with uh, gravel, which was loaded with what? Minerals. So what he did, he said, I'm going to tap my resource and my subsoil with my plants, which are going to harvest those minerals, bring them up to the top, and then I'm going to use those forages to fertilize and create topsoil. He had no topsoil. Light, and, and again, remember, he had to make an example that was affordable. We're talking people that could not afford to put in the money. It's expensive to remineralize a worn out farm all at once. You got to do it with biological systems in tandem with the fertility. Because the biology is the exponential factor that we don't even understand. I'll go into some of this. It's fantastic what we're learning about biology. I mean, we have robots on Mars looking for microbes, and we don't even know what's in the soil here. Isn't that something? We got space shuttles that shoot missiles into the moon. I mean, we're pretty good. We're pretty clever. And we're expending this in terms of investigating the sphere we live in. It's an amazing sphere. There's no other sphere like it yet. I mean, the Hubble telescope has been looking for a long time, and we haven't found another blue, wet ball that has this particular <coughs> gift of life like we have here. It's not there yet. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I'll tell you, it's rare so far. And yet we're more concerned about finding life on dead planets 
than actually inventorying the life that is here, a plethora of life that's here, that's going to save our butts if we get it together in time. So what did he do? Grazing to produce manure. Not because manure is only fertilizer. When I was in, uh, after college, when I started this consultancy, I remember somebody from a state university coming out and saying, you know, manure has such little NPK value, it's not even worth hauling it to the field. And they knew back then manure wasn't manure. Manure is 25% by weight microbes. 25% by weight microbes. That's a lot of bugs. When you figure how little of a volume it takes to have a, 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 an exponential volume or number of bugs. But he knew it had hormones. He knew it had enzymes besides the bugs and carbon. He knew the legumes were going to fix nitrogen for the plow downs, tight rotations with small grains so the soil's not exposed to the elements, right? Mowing for mulch. When they got the grass to come up, they would mow it, even if it was weeds. Weeds are your friend. They're rehabilitating your ground. They compete with the crops you want to harvest, but in terms of rehabilitating soil, weeds are tenacious. I've done weed studies. They're incredibly, incredibly nutrient dense. You eat some weeds. Anybody ever eat dandelions for salads? That's a weed. And if you look at the analysis of a dandelion, it's unbelievable. It's high in protein and it's extremely nutrient dense in minerals. That's why I like to see them in pastures. They got deep tap roots. Most of these weeds have deep tap roots. So they're drought resistant and they produce microflora around that tap root. That's an ecosystem, that's a coral reef. And then it pulls those minerals up and the plant dies or you mow it and guess what happens? The subsoil comes up to the topsoil. You know, you're homogenizing the soil strata. You're doing it with biology and you're speeding up the process. And that's what they did here. And they found out that what's above is equal to what's below. So if you have three tons dry matter equivalent, three tons of dry matter on the top, that's going to mirror what's on, down below. You'll have three tons below. And if Another way of talking about that is the livestock that you have walking around on the top of your soil, what that ground can support on the top. You should have a mirror image of the same weight of livestock below. That's a lot of microbes. If you have, let's say, you know, a cow and a calf. You know, let's say you have 1,200 pounds of live weight per acre. You're going to have at least 1,200 pounds of live weight underneath that ground. And that, you got to have that. So this is all they did. They used four tons of limestone every 12 years. That's not a lot of money. 300 pounds of a low analysis, 5, 12, 12 every three years. This is very cost effective. They seeded directly without plowing, direct seeding with trash mulch surfaces. And what did they find out? They said, you know what, here's something that's interesting. Until the roots got into that mineral rich subsoil, they had a lot of leaf hopper damage. You know what leaf hoppers are? That little chewing insect. A lot of leaf hopper damage until the roots got down to the subsoil, which were rich in boron. Remember the 1940 slide I showed you? Boron was one of the big ones. Well, I looked up some old research, University of Vermont, 1936. And what did they find out? Is that soils that were fertilized with boron had very low incidence of leaf hopper. Well, boron is an element in the body of humans and animals and plants that catalyzes and mobilizes the macro element called calcium. And I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. And calcium is the king of nutrients because we are calcium critters. We use calcium more than any other element. It's not more important than phosphorus or zinc but we use more of it, and it's responsible for building cell walls. And our skeletal mass, 90%, 90-some percent of it goes in our teeth and our bones. 1% is floating around in the bloodstream, and it's really important to understand that. So what they did is they just, they had this, this, this uh, restoring the clay ground. They didn't have this, this uh, glacial till subsoil, and they had to do it by mixing up the trash. Sheet composting, they called it. Grinding up the stuff from the top and plowing it down, and they use what this thing called a semen power tiller. That's what it looks like. That's a no-till operation, sort of. They're actually going inside, and you see those two little tiller hoppers 